Well, Father, we come before you today in the name of Jesus. Father, our heart's desire is to learn from your word, to learn how to move in your kingdom. Father, we also seek your wisdom, Father, to be able to uh, discern that which is clean from unclean, that which is holy from that which is unholy. And Father, your kingdom from the kingdom of darkness. Father, if there was ever a day, if there was ever an hour that we need to be able to separate the two, Lord, it's in our day. And Father, we ask that you would impart a fresh anointing upon the remnant, that those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, Father, for us to be able to do that very thing. And we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. This is number 22 or part 22 in understanding the kingdom. And I want to talk about Solomon this morning. You know, I was down uh, in Oklahoma City and we were filming for Prophecy Watchers. And during the discussion, I was able to get into a conversation with Gary about the book of Proverbs. And he actually confirmed a lot of the things that I believe that when we look at the book of Proverbs on a, just a surface level, it's just these little neat snippets that are supposed to be a wisdom. But when you really understand what's going on with the book of Proverbs, it's a very dark book because it's contrasting two kingdoms. It's about two women. One is called wisdom and represents the kingdom of God. The other one is a prostitute. That's very seductive. That represents the mystery religions. And so really, the entire book of Proverbs is really dealing with those aspects of these two different women and how basically Solomon knew because Solomon got bit by the whore of Babylon and it greatly affected his kingdom. And so I want to start today in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 5. Now this is, Solomon finds himself where David positioned him to be the king over Israel. And so he's a young man and he knows that he has an impossible task. And Almighty God appears before him in a dream. In Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night and the Lord asked. And the Lord said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto thy servant David my father great mercy, accordingly as, according as he had walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept him this great kindness, and thou hast given him a son to set on his throne as it is this day. And notice that that's in comparison to what happened to King Saul. Because what Saul did, his throne was abolished, and God established the throne of David. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to uh, go out or to come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this so thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord, that, so that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto them, Because thou hast asked this thing, and not hast asked thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked to thine own, uh, for the life of thine own enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart. And so there will be none like thee before thee, neither shall there be any arise after unto thee. So he asked for wisdom. And there was a, a time in the zenith of, of Solomon's reign that kings and queens would come from all over the known world to simply hear his wisdom. That it influenced his household and his servants when the queen of Sheba came to Israel. That she didn't necessarily pay attention to the, uh, the princes of the court. She watched the servants. 
And she said the way that the servants were dressed, the way that they conducted themselves, showed the wisdom and the understanding that was there in his household. And it impressed her. However, something happened in the life of Solomon. You see, that there, there was a time in his reign that gold and silver were so plenteous they piled it up like junk in the courtyards in Jerusalem. They didn't have enough room for all of it. That under the reign of King David and under his reign that Israel prospered beyond belief. And that they, it, it, just, it just caused everything to prosper. But yet in the midst of that, he wasn't satisfied. We read Ecclesiastes how, that, how that he wanted to know things he really should have known. He had to know everything and found out there's nothing new under the sun. In fact, it became so prominent that at his death, his kingdom was divided in half. You had the northern tribes and the southern tribes because of what happened in the latter days with Solomon. Now, when I, I read commentators that note some of the bad features of Solomon, one in Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 11, he loved luxury. In 1 Kings 11, 1 through 3, he married pagan women. There's going to be a purpose behind that I'm going to share here in a minute. Pagan women leaded to 1 Kings 11, 4 through 8. He got into idolatry. And so the very thing that he was asking wisdom to avoid and to be able to discern good and bad, he went after the bad. He married pagan women. He began to go into idolatry. And the last phase of this we find in 1 Kings 12, verses 1 through 4, he ended up enslaving Israel. Because the one thing that Israel asked after the death of Solomon to his son that reigned after him was, you got to get this yoke off of us. He has enslaved us with taxation beyond belief. But what set in the heart of Solomon manifested in his son, and he had all these young counselors instead of the, the older, wiser men of Israel said, you know what, you can really be popular, give them a tax cut. And he said, no, I'm going to double it, divided the nation. But we need, to, we need to understand what happened here, and we find a glimpse of this in 1 Kings 5, verse 12. And the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he had promised, and there was peace between him and Hiram and Solomon. And they two made a league together. Hiram was king of Tyre, and I actually find him entering into the life of David, that when David became king, he, Hiram controlled Lebanon and all the forests of Lebanon, one of the things that Lebanon was famous for were cedar, the cedar of Lebanon. You'll find over and over in the Word of God. And so when David became king, he kind of weaseled in using commerce and brought and said, I'll give you all the cedar you need to build your house or to build your palace. But he also comes in and does the same thing with Solomon but it goes a lot further. It's like, hey, I was your daddy's friend. I'm going to be your friend. Let's do commerce together. But they entered into league together. Now, Hiram, or as the Masons would call him, Hiram Abiff, was also deep into the mystery religions of Babylon. And as you study him out, there's another group that was connected to Hiram. It's called the Merchants of Tarshish. Well, the merchants of Tarshish, as you, and they, they were very wealthy merchants that controlled a lot of the commerce. And what's interesting is you follow them all throughout history, they group into a place that leads them right into the Illuminati. That that's part of what they became. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of interesting things that go along in this. And so Hiram began to introduce him to the mystery religions that I believe the reason that he went and married these pagan women was because among, when you understand uh, the mystery religions, it all founded in Babylon. When God came down and confused the languages, 70 nations were established. 
And so aspects of Mystery Babylon were fragmented into these 70 nations. No one had all the pieces of the puzzle. Hiram most likely had a lot of the pieces of the puzzle. That's one of the reasons that in Masonic lore, he is their hero. He is the Messiah type. That, uh, that guys, <laughs> and this shows you some of the crazy things that Solomon did out of this relationship. He subcontracted and hired Hiram to build the temple. I have always marveled at why you did that. Now, he tried to play safeguards. He surrounded the, the temple area the, where, they were, uh, where they were building. He had praisers and worshipers there 24 hours a day while, he, while this mystery religion guy was building the temple. Because of Hiram, you have two pillars on the outside of the entrance of the temple that are basically the twin pillars of Hercules. They put J on one and B on the other for, I think it's Boaz and, and Jacob, or the, I forgot what the J's for. Hmm? Jacob. But that's the twin pillars of Hercules. It, it's, it's symbolic of the mystery religions. It goes all the way back to where when Adam and Eve fell, that there was pillars that was erected by God to separate the third heaven from the first heaven. And that what the Nakesh came to give was supposed to bring all that back together. That's symbolic in that. And from Solomon on, guys, there's this interweaving of the mystery religions along with the true faith. We have it in Solomon. We have it later on begin to manifest uh, in the Herodians during the New Testament period where the, the Herods had rebuilt the temple. They had, they had brought themselves in a league with Rome and, the, and I have read archaeological uh, findings that the very palace, the floor of the palace, where Herod had decreed, oh, Messiah has come, I'll go down and worship him, and he actually was, I'm going to go down and kill him, that there was a zodiac in the floor of his palace. So you have that interwoven. You have in the New Testament times, you have, you have the Nicolaitans and all those that came out of what, are, what is known as the Egyptian Essenes. Now, they're just the opposite of the Jewish Essenes that were in the desert, and they separated because of the evils that was going on in the temple, and it was there that John the Baptist was raised. Well, you had, the, you had these other kind that archaeologists call the Egyptian Essenes that we have the, the Nag Hammadi come out of that was all this mysticism that they began interweaving this Egyptian mysticism with Christianity. And you have the development of the Nicolaitans and all these different things in the New Testament that Jesus said, I hate them. That's also what sprang up Jezebel, came out of, out of the, the Nag Hammadi and, and what was done there. And so that's constantly interwoven. And in fact, we, we know from tradition that John, the apostle of love, so hated the Gnostics that one time after, as an old man coming into the city, that there was a known famous Gnostic preacher that was drinking from the well and the apostle of love refused to drink from the same well in public in fear that somebody would identify him with this Gnostic. That's how much it was dreaded. And then it came together into a culmination with Constantine. That all he did is he brought it all together and brought their mystery religions together and gave them a veneer of Christianity as it had been established with the Egyptian Essenes. And so we have all of that going on. And under Catholicism, or under what became uh, with the Roman Empire, they ended up having two vast libraries of esoteric knowledge. One in, called the Vatican, one in Alexandria. When Alexandria was destroyed, one of the, one of the things that I have come to believe is that it was, it was Muslim raiders that destroyed Alexandria. I do not think they destroyed the library. I believe that they confiscated the library. That's why now there is such a union in the world with those of, of mystery Babylon and Islam. There's a quote from Albert Pike that says that on the Masonic altar, which is the altar of Nimrod, that there are three books. There's the Tanakh, there's the Bible, and there's the Quran. And he said there are three books, only one of them is true. Hmm, can't be the, can't be the Tanakh or the Bible. It leaves one from his perspective because it expresses the mystery religions. And so here we have all of this that we are fighting, that the mystery religions seek to permeate everything that we do. 
We can even see it in the formation of the United States that we had Jesuits constantly telling the founding fathers, come follow us, we'll teach you how to build kingdoms. We'll teach you how to control money. We'll teach you how to control all these things. And even though we had Masons that helped found this nation, they were doing so on the back of the revivals of Jonathan Edwards and Whitfield and many others that it affected them and they ended up encoding things into the Constitution that to this day are a problem for the mystery religions. That's why they seek to do away with it. Because it's standing in the way of what they want. So we, we, we have Solomon that, that sought wisdom. He should have sought wisdom from God as, as seeking a wife or a lover. And then you have this whore that's in the book of Proverbs that's standing in the shadows saying, Come here. Come here. I got secrets I show you. There's pleasures that I can show you. There's mysteries I can show you. Now, we can't share them in public. This is only for the adepts. This is only for those who come in deeper into my chambers. That's the whole of the book of Proverbs. Now let's look at the contrasting of the two. I want to start today in Proverbs chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. Now I want you to contrast the two. Wisdom crieth out without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse or business. In the opening of the gates. What's the gates? That's where the elders of the city would be, isn't it? So wisdom from God is to be made abroad in public so that everyone can hear, so that everyone can understand. There, there's no secret stuff going on here. It's all to be done in the light of day. This is how the kingdom of God operates. You do not see Mystery Babylon coming on the air and saying, here's all the stuff of Mystery Babylon. We're going to make it plain so that everybody can know. No, Albert Pike in Morals and Dogma says when people come into the Masonic Hall, we lie to them and we say this is what all the symbols mean. It's to be obscured from them. Only the adept is allowed to know. Only those that dig deeper. They don't tell you that when you first enter into the Blue Lodge, that that initial ritual that you do, step for step, word for word, is the exact same ritual to become a witch or to enter into any of the mystery religions which are deep in the occult. They don't tell you that. They don't tell you that that trapezoid altar is the altar of Nimrod. They don't tell you any of that. But you are tricked into bowing before an altar and asking the God of that lodge to give you light. Now compare that to the way that we proclaim the gospel. Jesus went and made everything. He said it all publicly. And when they tried to try him in secret, he said, did I not share all these things openly with you? The kingdom of God and the truths of the kingdom are to be declared openly so that all can examine, all can understand. That's the way the kingdom of God operates. And it says, in this city she uttered her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? How long, you dumb ones, will love your dumbness? Because it goes along with your flesh. And the scorners delight in their scorning, and the fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. See, that's, that's, isn't that the preaching of the gospel? You've got to leave sin. You've got to leave being a scorner. You've got to leave being a fool. And you've got to surrender to Jesus. How long? And, and people hate the gospel, the real gospel, the preaching of the cross, the blood of Jesus, repentance. People hate that. Mystery Babylon really hates it because it begins to turn the light on. And you know what happens when... You get an old house somebody hadn't cleaned that much and the cockroaches are all over the place and they're, and they're having their secret meetings and you turn the light on. <laughs> but notice what she says here. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit upon you. Oh, 
Kind of sounds like Joel chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2, doesn't it? What is this saying? We're, we're in a day and we're in an hour. That the two kingdoms are beginning to butt heads like nobody's business. There is an active war by anything that has been touched by the mystery religions to combat our Judeo-Christian heritage and the light that comes from this. They will call it secular. They will call it human rights. They will call it whatever they want to call it. But what's interesting is you cannot consider one human right over another human right. That, yes, you may have your human right to this, but you can't take away what somebody's religious freedom. That's one of the founding principles of this nation. But they seem to. They, they, they've looked for the hook, the way of suppressing to get wisdom out of the way because they want the, the ascension of the mystery religions over the earth because they're preparing for their coming Messiah. And yet wisdom is still crying out in the streets saying, you know what, repent, yield to me, and I'll pour out my spirit on you. The remnant are getting ready, if they will position themselves right with God, that the word of God is going to become alive to them like no other generation before them, because wisdom is waiting to pour the spirit of God on those that yielded to her voice, that yielded to her call, that will not yield to the other. Now, I want to compare that to Proverbs chapter 2, starting with verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with, the, uh, with thee, so that thou incline thy ear unto wisdom and apply thy heart to understanding, if thou wilt criest after knowledge and lift up thy voice after understanding, if thou seekest her. See, it's still talking about the good woman as silver, and searches for her as hidden treasure. Then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For, okay, this, we're, we're still getting into what the good one does here now. And said, for the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is the buckler of them that walk uprightly. How would I like to have the Lord be your buckler? He causes me to do this as, as I seek after him. He keepeth the path of, paths of judgment and preserveth the way of saints. How many know that in the days ahead we need God to preserve us? Because darkness is coming. Then thou shalt understand righteousness and judgment and equity. Yea, every good path. I like that. Every good path. Underline that in your Bible. That we will understand every good path. If there is a way to walk in God unto blessing. If there is a way to walk into God unto, unto, unto salvation, unto safety. All these things that we need in this day that is found in Jesus and Jesus alone and in the gospel and in the Torah. It's all one book written by one God. Then thou shalt understand righteousness and judgment and equity in every good path. Then wisdom entered, entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. Discretion shall preserve thee, and understanding shall keep thee. Oh, I like that. But you know what I'm finding a lot in the body of Christ? Nobody wants to dig deep. Everybody wants, wants this little snippet theology is what I call it. You know, I've, I've had so many people email me and say, oh yeah, what about this verse? You know, Paul said that, you know, I, I can do all things, but all things are not profitable. They pull that out of an entire chapter where Paul is railing about them of leaving sin. And then they say, see, I can sin. And then they, they separate it from the very chapter above it where he's talking about everything good, everything of the kingdom. All things within the kingdom are, are permissible. Not all sin, because he's telling them, you got to leave this, you got to leave this, you got to leave this. Now imagine in the way everybody interprets this. Boy, you got to leave this, this. Now I can do it, but you can't because I'm an apostle. But <laughs> that, that's basically what they're saying. He's saying, and it's wrong. They don't want to dig deep. They don't want to understand. They don't want discernment. They don't want discretion. They want excuses to do everything that delights the flesh. You set yourself up for that, you will run after the whore of Babylon. Because she will promise you, even this hyper grace 
I read a, a wonderful book last week by Dr. Ken Johnson. It's called The Gnostic Origins of Calvinism. Man, did he put a lot of pieces of the puzzle together for me. I had, I had some of them, but there were some missing. That the, the Nag Hammadi, the, the Egyptian Essenes, they also, they believed that Yahweh was one of many gods created by Sophia. That they were emanations. And, and poor Yahweh, he was, he was an immun, uh, uh, this emanation from Sophia, but he, th- he thought he was all by himself. And so he said, you'll worship nobody else but me because there's none like me. He not knowing that, that, he, that there were all these other ones that came from this same higher being that began having babies that we call gods, is what they teach. And then they went on to say, now, if you have one of these emanations from Sophia within you, and you know, some people do and some people don't, those that do are predestined, and no matter what they do, they're going to go to heaven. That was taught by the mystery religions coming out of Egypt. And so Calvin is looking at them, and he's having a problem in the beginnings of the, Reforma- in the Reformation period because you have, you have all these Protestants saying, we're not going to follow the Pope. And so what the, and, and the king said that, then the Pope says, well, I, execu- I excommunicate your entire country. That means if anybody dies from the day of excommunication until they rise up and kill their king and come back underneath the Pope, you're all going to hell. And so Calvin looked at what, the, what these Gnostics were doing, saying, well, you know, th- there's this whole thing about these emanations and this election, that if we're elected, then the Pope can't get rid of it. And so he pulled from the Egyptian Essenes the whole doctrine of election and, and, and this and established it and says, Pope, if we are predestined to be saved, we have this emanation from God and, and you can't discount it. Even heaven can't discount it because grace is irrevocable. It's irresistible and it's irrevocable. Ha, 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 ha. And that's what he used to come against the Pope. Not that it was sound theology. Now, there's probably a lot of Calvinists going to get mad. Go study it for yourself. We need to quit drawing from mystery Babylon to defend the word of God. How about dismissing everything of mystery religion and stick with the word? The, the Kabbalists have done the same thing within Judaism. You can take Kabbalah and trace it all the way back to, to uh, Akiba, who rejected the Messiah, but wanted the supernatural power he saw within the New Testament church. And so basically what he did is he pulled from what they had learned in Babylon and created a pseudo-Holy Spirit within the Kabbalic magical workings. So it's in Judaism, it's embedded in, in Christianity through the, through the Catholic Church, and now you actually have Protestants pulling from it to combat the Pope. How many know that you don't pull from darkness to battle darkness? It's got to be the Word of God. Verse 12, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of uprightness and to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the forwardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked and they they forward in their paths. And so now he is beginning to contrast. He's saying, listen, the light from God, the way of the kingdom, and it has to begin with Torah because Torah, what God used Moses and said, listen, you're coming out of 400 years of bondage of mystery religion in Egypt, and so everything that you have known has been the mystery religions, so I've got to tell you how to separate the two. That's part of what the Torah does, to tell clean from unclean, righteousness from unrighteousness, light from darkness. And then we go in the next verse here in 16, we pick up, and I love this, to to deliver thee from the strange woman. Let me tell you something, when you really understand the ways of God, the mystery religion Babylon that used to be so alluring ends up looking strange. But strange can also mean exotic. Just want to put that out there. It's exotic, it's tempting. Standing behind the shadows. Oh, I've got all these wonders that I can show you. Let me show you how nations really work. Let me show you how to move in wealth beyond your imagination. 
Let me give you fame and fortune. How many captains of industry have fallen for that? How many actors that went out to Hollywood, usually the only ones that ever make it, bow at that altar? And then when you find out the abominations that they do to get into that club and to maintain that club, you can't stand watching them on TV anymore. It's an abomination. Because they went after the strange woman. Then you kind of wonder, why do we even prize their political views when it comes from Mystery Babylon? That's just the whole other ball of wax. <clears throat> to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth, and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death, and her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, neither take they hold of the path of life. One of the hardest things, guys, to get a Christian completely free is either they have been in Freemasonry or what's worse, they, have, they are a second or third or fourth descendant of Freemasonry and don't know it and they try to serve God and all hell breaks loose in their lives. We, Solomon talked about that in the Proverbs. They, it's hard for them to get back to the way of life because there's something within them that hungers after that unless those curses are broken. There's something that hungers. Now let's jump to uh, Proverbs 5, verses thir uh, 3 through 14. This is talking more about this, about this strange woman, this exotic woman. From the lips of a strange woman drippeth as a honeycomb, and her mouth is smoother than oil. Alluring, isn't it? She'll tell you anything that you want to hear. You know, that's really, just on a natural note, that's the, the best prostitutes, that's the way they work. They tell you what they, they create a fantasy for you. And they will tell you anything you want to hear to entrap you. Oh, your woman doesn't understand you. Yes, your woman does. That's probably one of the reasons she has some problems with you. <laughs> <laughs> come on now um but a strange woman but listen to this okay even though her words are like the honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil but her end is bitter as wormwood and as sharp as a two-edged sword her feet go down to death and her steps take hold on hell lest thou shouldest ponder the ways of life her ways are movable that thou canst not know them. You see, that's part of the mystery religions. Come join us and we'll, we'll give you everything. We'll, we'll show you the mysteries that go all the way back to Nimrod. Okay, first degree, you come in there. No, 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 we, we moved it. It's now the, now the sixth degree. Now move, okay. No, 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 no. You know that the, in, in what I have discovered in all my research with Freemasonry, you can get to the 33rd degree and still not have a clue. Now, it's opened up the gates of hell to you like you would not believe. But depending upon your heart, and they're watching you, and you using key phrases and connecting with things spiritually, there are a lot of places beyond the 33rd degree that will open up to you if you're plugged into the whore. But what they do is, you got to get here. No, it's here. No, 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 you got to get here. No, it's here. No, 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 you got to get here. It's here. I remember Bill Snublin talking about this one group that they had, they had this labyrinth that you had to go through, and it was literally like the labyrinth of the Minotaurs, that there were things, and you had to go through it blindfolded. And many people died. And when you, you get to the center of this thing, I, I, if I remember, I think it was a feather or something, in that, or, or, or no, it was a grain of corn, or wheat in the center. And so here you prepared for years to go through this labyrinth, you get to the labyrinth, and they give you a piece of wheat and say, there's the mystery. It's always moved. It's always movable. You never get there. How many know that the moment that you really find Jesus, you've arrived? And he doesn't move. What he does is he pulls you deeper into him and you begin to change. He's stationary. And the more that I get to know him, the deeper it is. And, and, and it's like it's satisfying 
beyond belief, but yet I want more. I want to get so lost in him I can't find myself anymore. Isn't that what Jesus said? He that seeks to find his life shall lose it. He that loses this life, because I got lost in Jesus, I finally found it. That's the way the kingdom operates compared to the mystery religions. We see the mystery religions are so consumed with this movable thing that they have come under the belief that they have got to suppress every other voice, any other thing that's not a part of the mystery religions to get their utopia. They've got to suppress everything else because they're hunting for that which is movable. And in the very end, the very one that, that, that is brought forth by the works of the Antichrist will even betray them. It's all movable. You never really attain Where it was, oh, move, okay. Verse 6. Lest thou should ponder the path of life, her ways are movable, that thou cannot know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart, from the words, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not near the door of her house. Never let your foot enter into the house of a coven or a house of the lodge. Don't enter in. Boy, isn't the Word of God just straightforward about some things? If it's there and we understand what's being said. Lest thou give thine honor unto others and thy years unto what? The cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. Thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed and say, How have I hated instruction and my heart despised reproof? Do you know how many men of God sitting in a good fundamentalist church begin really preaching the word and begin preaching salvation and men that are, uh, that are of either Masonic descent or Masons themselves will rise up and destroy a revival? I have had students and graduates, one of them, that he, that he was hired to be the youth pastor, and something amazing happened during vacation Bible school. All these kids started getting saved. I mean, a bunch of them started getting saved. And you figure that this fundamentalist church would be happy that all these kids got saved, and as soon as they could get a hold of him, they set him down and they fired him. They said, we do not want that here. Kids getting saved, turned on for Jesus, getting in the Word of God. We will not have that here. We would rather go through the motions so that people could feel like they were doing something, but it's all mystery Babylon and it's controlled. Oh, and he found out that every board member that did that was a Freemason, by the way. Oh, 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 oh. Those that have the mystery religion that can go up to four generations, and the fourth generation is usually the more, most crucial because if they can't draw you back in, then they lose that bloodline. That's why those that are the fourth, because now let's say, let's say you have Jim that's a Freemason and his son Johnny joins Freemasonry, that's again the first generation. Every time they bow at that altar, our witchcraft or, or illumination, or whatever they call it, Rosicrucianism. There's, there's a myriad of names. It's kind of like Hydra. It has a million heads. Let me tell you something. If it doesn't start at the cross and end at the cross, and it's the grace of God and the holiness of God and returning back to the Word of God, it'll lead you straight to hell. And, and the bad part about it is when a man kneels at that masonic altar he thinks he's setting his family up for greatness and and to, and to be able to move into wealth and stuff what he doesn't know he's damning his children to hell and they've got to fight like hell to get out of it even after they come into the realization of the gospel there's all these connectors that are connected to them the reason they wear the apron not only does it cover what represents their god but that god that god claims everything that comes from their loins time for us to open our eyes and realize what's going on around us and it will cause them he said ah, now how i have hated instruction and my heart despises reproof preacher don't correct me i'm tired of conviction 
There's an easy way to stop conviction. Are you ready for it? You yield to it and you repent. You get right with God and the conviction stops. You want it to stop that way because the only other way is to have a reprobate mind. He goes on to say in verse 3, And have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor have I inclined mine ear to them that instruct me. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and the assemblies. What's this talking about here, guys? <laughs> Jesus shared it this way, that there was a field this man had, and he planted wheat. And his enemies came at night and sown tares in his field both within Judaism and within Christianity are the fields of God. And the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. And those tares love the mystery religions. Those tares love Babylon. Those tares love these things. And they hate instruction. They hate the preaching of the gospel. And there are men today that call themselves ministers of the gospel that hate the commandments of God. The apostle Paul would look at them and shake his head. And say, you don't understand a thing that I said. He was a kosher, Torah-keeping rabbi that proclaimed Messiah to the Gentiles. Oh, my. Now, I want to look at the days ahead. And I believe they're kind of unfolding before our very eyes right now. Both for those that align themselves with the whore and those that align themselves with the kingdom of God, which is actually going back, let's go back to Proverbs chapter 1, because that's where this woman was introduced, isn't it? So we're going to find out what happens to her and what happens to her followers with what happens to those that hear wisdom crying out in the streets. And this is starting in verse 24. Now this is wisdom. This woman that's of God and this is her talking to those that refuse to listen to her. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught on my counsel and would none of my reproof. When the prophecy hits the fan and you start calling out to the, for the kingdom of God, this is what's going to happen. I also will laugh at your calamity and I will mock when your fear cometh. Now that's scary. You see, there are those that are going to get religion, if you will, and try to get themselves out of the esoteric hole that they dug when the prophecy starts hitting the fan. Too late. The Bible says to, today is the day of salvation. Now, repent now while God can be found because there, come, there comes a time as we unfold prophecy that God is going to be very, very hard to find. She says, I will also laugh at your calamity, and I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Why? Because you've already rejected her. If there was ever a time, listen to me, if there was ever a time to press into the things of God, it's now. It's now. God is putting a fresh anointing to pour out His Spirit upon us so that we can get right now. Now, some of us over the last couple of years, we have went through some hell in this process because Almighty God loved us enough to show us what was in us that disgusted us so that we could get rid of it. And my goodness, there's been a lot of it. And about the time you think you've got it taken care of, God will let a situation oh, pop something else. And crucify that thing. Get rid of it. Because there's coming a time that if, you're, that if part of you is in line with Mystery Babylon, with what's coming, it will take you with it. And you're going to cry out to God and there's not going to be any help. Why? Because you, reje you can't reject stuff for 30, 40, 50 years of your life and when the prophecy starts hitting the fan, think that it's time that you can repent now. You can't do that. Verse 30, And they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. 
Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Oh, did, 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 you, did you just get that? Can you prosper in Mystery Babylon? Yes. But God calls it the prosperity of fools. What does it serve a man to gain everything and to lose his soul? But I want you to underline verse 33, and I want you to determine in your heart, I am going to be this verse. But who hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil. You see, I do believe in the rapture of the church. The harpazo is very clear in Scripture. I believe it's going to be a whole lot closer to the end. I'm kind of like Walter Martin. I pray for pre and I prepare for post. Jesus can come back anytime he wants to. I'm not going to argue with him. And if, he, and if I'm wrong and he comes back pre-trib, I'm going to give every pre-trib preacher a high five on the way up. Okay? But here is what I know. There's another rapture or a type of rapture that's coming before the church. Jesus said that the angels are going to go forth and pull up the tares and cut them off and bind them into bundles and burn them. Before he did. The tares will be dealt with before the wheat. Selah. And see, what this is talking about is there is a recompense coming for the tares. But you have to wait. There, there's this concept with God. And sometimes to me it's been kind of frustrating. Because, you know, why didn't you take care of the devil when he first fell? Why, didn't, why, don't you, why don't you take care of the Amalekites now? And God says, I can't. Their iniquity is not full. There's this concept with God that when the wheat and tare are side by side, you can't tell them apart when they're, when they're young. But see, tare have no fruit. They, they have hollow heads. <laughs> So all the esoteric knowledge in the world, what it's going to give you is a hollow head. Because when they're matured, the tares stand erect in the field. But there is wheat, there's fruit, fruit in the lives of the wheat. And so as they mature, the more they mature, the more they bow before the king of the universe. Oh, that which has not bowed at the throne of Jesus will be cut down, bundled up, and burned by God. And when it starts, the tares that rejected the correction of God, they rejected the preaching of the cross, they rejected needing to leave that whore. Why, and why is Mystery Babylon called a whore? Because she will sleep with anything that she believes will give her power or position or wealth. And it's very eclectic. She has many lovers. The faithful, the bride, is faithful to her king. One. One. While Babylon has many gods, Shema Israel, Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. There's one God that we serve, Yahweh Elohim. And I demonstrated and, and shown in the Shiner Directive how Yahweh is one of the best representations of Jesus there ever was. Not only is yod Hey vav Hey representing the God with the nailed hand shall be revealed twice. Sounds like Jesus to me. Come on. But Yahweh represents the mercy of God. And we forget when he's coming back, he's coming back as Elohim which represents the justice and judgment of God. Jesus is not separate from the Father. Even the rabbis know this, that there are leading rabbis in Israel. One, one, I've got, I got one of the leading rabbis' books in my library that he absolutely rocked Israel when he said Jesus is the Messiah. 
that there are rabbis that Dr. Koch knows that, that said, I can, I can intellectually perceive that Jesus is the Messiah. Please pray for me that I can know it in my heart. And reading the book of Daniel, they say, I, there, we know that there are aspects of the Almighty, the Ancient of Days, that no man can know. But the aspect of God that we can know is called the Son of Man. Who do you say the Son of Man am? <laughs> they knew that the Son of Man was the knowable aspect of Almighty God. One God. Jesus sat down and told Moses, here are my commandments. I am the one who delivered you out of Egypt. He is still the one who delivers us out of the Egypt today, is he not? Here are my commandments. Here's how my, here's how my kingdom rolls, Bubba. And let me tell you something. That same God that gave it to Moses stood among the people of Israel, and he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. They're his Jesus was very emphatic. He said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. It be my day. <laughs> and it's still his day. I align myself with him now. I yield to the voice of wisdom crying out in the streets. Come to the cross. Let me get you, let me, let me nullify the iniquity force in your life. Let me free you from iniquity and bring you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of my dear son. And let me begin renewing your mind to the word. Let me pour my spirit out upon you so that you can renew your mind to the word so that when the chopping block begins to happen, that you're bowing in reverence before the king instead of the pride that esotericism brings you because it's the lie of the Nakesh. Every one of them, what they're doing, when you, when you, when you root it all down, whether it's Buddhism, Hinduism, or any of the other isms, even the Masonic, it's how to become a god. That's why Nimrod is so highly esteemed, because he became a gibberim. He corrupted himself and became a demigod. And God says, I'm about to cut that off out of the earth. I've about had my fill. Let's make sure that what we're living and what we're doing, we're not shacked up with something. Huh? If you can't find Christmas and Easter in the Word of God, even though Easter is in the King James, it's a mistranslation of the word Passover, Pashach. If it's not in the Word, why do we do it? It was established by Mystery Babylon out of Rome. Why are we doing it? I, I kind of had fun with, with Gary. You know, I asked him, I said, why do Baptist church start church at 11 o'clock every Sunday morning? Oh, I don't know, Brother Mike. What was it? Because Luther couldn't hold his liquor in old age. His eyes got about this big. <laughs> and he thought about that. He said, you know, I had a, a friend that uh, got a scholarship and he actually was going to study at a prestigious uh, seminary in Germany that was Lutheran. And he said, so he gets over there and they said, we're, gonna, we're actually going to have church out in, the, out in an open field. They had banquet tables and everything. And he said the president of the seminary got up and was blessing God for this cold pitcher of beer. And he said, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like this kid's mind was just smoking. How can you bless beer? <laughs> I'm a teetotaler. I was, you know, Protestants teetotalers, you know. I said, exactly. And I said, Luther, the older he got, they would argue theology and drank beer on Saturday night. And the older he got, the later and later they'd have to have church because he couldn't hold his liquor. Now, isn't it amazing that we have this whole league of Baptists that have church at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning all because a Lutheran couldn't hold his liquor and they're all teetotalers? <laughs> isn't history funny sometimes? But that's how sneaky the mystery religions can be. They, what, what was error or, or an old man's necessity two or three centuries ago becomes our staunch doctrine today. And none of it's found in this book. If it's not in here, and you can't show me chapter and verse in context with two or three witnesses to established doctrine, you're dealing with mystery Babylon with a veneer of a scripture wrapped over the top of it. Lord, give us discernment in this hour. Oh, Father, we thank you for your truth. And Father, 
We cry out for your wisdom. We cry out for the wisdom of the kingdom of God this morning. Father, we ask that you would open our ears, open our eyes to your truth. Father, let everything of Mystery Babylon become a stench to us, become repulsive to us, and let us hunger and thirst after the righteousness which is of Jesus and Jesus alone. Father, give us eyes to see wonders out of your word and let us seek to know and to be able to have discernment between good and evil, unclean and clean, and the kingdom of God from the kingdom of darkness. Father, loose an anointing within everyone who hears this message. Father, let it be a turning point in our lives. Let the anointing of the Holy Spirit flow today. Within your remnant, we ask in Jesus' name.